Network Stars. Um, she's known for podcasting, astronomy cast, and other science outreach activities. And she's going to be talking about how we as skeptics can walk the fine line between excessive credulity and excessive contrarianism, um, which is such a difficult thing to do in a world where we can't be experts on everything or even most things. Please welcome Dr. Pamela Gay.
estimate that some $2 million per year is spent on antibiotics because people ignored the null hypothesis. The idea that if, if your treatment actually works, there should be a statistically significant difference between the outcomes of your treatment and, and what happens randomly. Now, to say that there's a statistically different population, this is where things start getting messy, because what does that mean? This particular room, if, if you look at the individuals, we're a statistically different population than outside in the rest of the city of Wellington. Just looking about, I'm guessing that we're a bit older, we're a bit more male, we're certainly wearing a lot more black, myself being an exception. And we are a statistically different population, but how statistically significant? In order for most theories to be proven, if I wanted to say this is a significantly different population than the general population of Wellington, I would generally have to say that this population is so different that there is a less than 5% probability of randomly grabbing this population of people from the greater population of Wellington. And in fact, for some studies, they actually look for a, a less than half a percent probability of randomly drawing this population. So the way of turning that around is your theory has achieved the null hypothesis. It, it's achieved the, it's really not valid. You have successfully proven random. Um, if, if there's a 5% or greater chance that this population could have been drawn from random. Now that's a whole lot of words. It's early in the morning. You're not caffeinated. We've already discussed that. What does this mean in terms of a real scenario? Well, most of us in school, because we're of that age, that they hadn't found planets in other solar systems yet when we were coming up, we learned in school that when solar systems form, they form with rocky planets next to the sun and gas planets far away, and this is reality. But if you then go outside, especially if you go outside and go above the Earth's atmosphere with the Space Telescope, kind of like the one that they called Kepler, and it now died, but prior to that, it did an amazing job at finding hundreds of planets around other stars. And when you look at the data that comes from Kepler, you see there are lots of gas giants snuggled up next to their star. You see there are lots of gas giants further out. And you see that there's absolutely no relationship between where gas giants are most likely to be found and any parameter. It's gas giants just happen. And so that initial theory that gas giants are more likely to be found far away from their star, false. Gas giants, there is no relationship between finding a gas giant and how far away you are from the sun. Null hypothesis was not disproven. That theory is wrong. Are you with me? Okay. So this is where we start getting into types of error. We all make mistakes. We're human. And, and there's basically three kinds of error. Now, in reality, mistakes come in infinite variety. Some of us have made mistakes in what feels like infinite variety. If you haven't made mistakes, that means you haven't bothered to live. I encourage you to make more. Now, mistakes can, in general, be grouped into to three categories. First, there, there are errors like those I've discussed, errors that come from an ignorance of statistics, errors that come from doctors ignoring the fact that there are large-scale studies saying that antibiotics don't help sinusitis. There are errors of people continuing to teach as they continue to teach that gas giants are found far away from stars, even though there's a plethora of evidence saying that's not true. That type of error, there isn't even a name for it. That's just being wrong. That happens. But then there are two other kinds of errors. There, there are type one errors. These are the false positives. 
I love this room. That's just awesome. <laughs> um, so, so with type one errors, this this is when you come up with a false positive. This this is when, for some unfortunate reason, you manage often using small number statistics to show that a hypothesis is true even when it's not. For instance, you might conclude that all stars burn hydrogen in their core if you only look at 10 or 15 stars. So if you go out at night, grab 10 or 15 stars, don't do it with your hands, or hurt yourself, and, and you measure their, their surface temperature, you measure their mass, you measure their radius, you can then do physics, and you can calculate the density in their cores, and using these calculations, you can come to understand, aha, this thing must be supporting itself by burning hydrogen. And if you only look at 10 or 15 stars, that may seem to be, well, I have evidence, I have a true theory. But it's not actually true, because there are stars out there that are burning carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. There are stars that are burning silicon into iron. But they're more rare. But because of small number statistics, I made a type 1 error. I made a false positive discovery because everything I looked at backed up my hypothesis. So that's one type of error that people make. Believing in something that isn't true simply because, well, the evidence they have, which isn't sufficient, seems to support their claim. Now, now the other type of error, named ever so imaginatively a type 2 error, is a false negative. This is the type of error that you get when you fail to see that a hypothesis is true. So turning around that exact same example, if, if I sat down and I worked out on paper that there must be stars that burn atoms that are progressively heavier up until the point that there is silicon burning into iron and then it stops. If, if I successfully come up, as Chandra Sekhar did, with all of these theories, and then I go out and I only look at those same 10 or 15 stars and I only see hydrogen burning, I might say, wow, I'm wrong. That's a type 2 error. So these are the two types of errors that we usually make in our day-to-day -day realities. We, we either come up with theories, and because we don't sample enough, we prove ourselves right or wrong, and we do so falsely. And, and this is where it, it suddenly becomes a matter of, well, okay, so that's statistics, but we're human beings, and we make mistakes too, and we don't bother with statistics most of the time. We, we think with our stomach more often than we should. How do we decide what we want to eat for dinner? Our stomach. How do we decide what to believe in? Well, we like to think we use our mind, our brain, our thought process, but the reality is our stomach keeps coming up, our heart keeps coming up. And in psychology, they also talk about type one and type two errors. And, and they look at it in a very similar way. So for instance, type one human errors occur when we believe in something with insufficient evidence, simply because, well, it sounds right and everyone's doing it, for instance, vitamin C. I love this quote. It's drawn from a medical paper. There's a DOI number. None of you can read it. But if you come to me later, I'll give it to you. This quote from the journal article says, the failure of vitamin C supplementation to reduce the incidence of colds in the normal population indicates that routine megadose prophylactis, i.e. taking vitamin C supplements that are like 500% the daily recommended dose that is needed to prevent scurvy, um, is not rationally justified for community use. But everyone takes vitamin C. No, no, they don't. But most people believe because, well, everyone, you, you, they're, why? Why is it the show? And, and there's no evidence that vitamin C works. And if you look into the history of vitamin C supplements, it boils down to a Nobel laureate from a completely unrelated field uh, swearing that supplements allowed him to live a prolonged life. And because he was a Nobel laureate, everyone listened to him. Um, 
it, it might be that, that you believe that babies are most often born when there's a full moon. But when you actually look at the data of when babies are born, this is based on North American USA data, um, babies tend to come in the summer, roughly nine months after the US holiday season. <laughs> I wouldn't understand why. Now, human beings also make type two errors. This, this occurs when you believe something isn't true even though it is. How many times have you heard something and it just seems far too good to be true? So, for instance, if you have hypertension, dark chocolate actually has medical efficacy. It actually, in study after study, has been proven to help with hypertension. And when I first heard this result, I was like, no, it's chocolate. It's bad for you. It tastes good. <laughs> that was a type 2 error. And, and these are things that, that we do. We're humans. And last week, I, I rewrote the talk I was planning to give today completely. Actually, starting yesterday, I rewrote the talk I was going to give today completely. Because while I was at Dragon Con in Atlanta, one of the, the skeptics there posed a very interesting question. He said, what if your average non-skeptical person, we, we I think are all fully aware we're the minority, um, what if your average non-scientific thinker is someone who makes more type one mistakes? What if there's someone who naturally is given over to believing their lucky sweatshirt actually helps them play sports better, who is naturally given over to wishfully thinking that if they give that girl on that first date oysters, they're more likely to get lucky. What if the average person is someone who's simply given to believing things, given minimal evidence? And what if people who are scientific thinkers, who are scientific skeptics, are given over to being less likely to believe things based on evidence? What if we're the ones who are forever dubious and doubtful and um, contrarian, is, is a word often applied? And this is, is one of those things that kind of stopped me cold. And I had to pause and say, I, I don't have data. I, want to find someone to do a dissertation on this now. And this is an awesome question. And it's something that we need to think about every day. Are there things that we simply cast aside because we, we simply have been trained to doubt? And so this got me to thinking, what is the definition of scientific skepticism? And I tried to go to the OED, and then I realized I'd have to pay $300 a year to do that, so I stopped. Um, and, and so I went to Wikipedia, because really Wikipedia is, is the crowdsourced understanding of our reality. And, and here, emphasis in this is, is mine. The, the definition is, a scientific or imperial skeptic is one who questions beliefs on the basic of scientific understanding. Most scientists, being scientific skeptics, test the reliability of certain kinds of claims by subjecting them to a systematic investigation using some form of scientific method. As a result, a number of claims are considered pseudoscience. These are the things that don't stand up against investigation. If they're found to improperly apply or ignore the fundamental aspects of the scientific method, Scientific skepticism may discard beliefs pertaining to things outside perceivable observation and, then, and thus outside the realm of systematic empirical, empirical falsifiability and testability. Those are a lot of words for this early in the morning. Not every question is a test, has a testable answer. And as skeptics, we have a choice to believe or not believe in things they can't be empirically tested. And some of us um, are, are very adamant about that. This is something that I think will come up in the panel discussion that's occurring later in this conference. That's a point this conference will come back to over and over. For now, I'd like to focus on what it means for something to be testable and how we as individuals who can't understand the entirety of the universe individually 
must test the people from whom and the sources from whom we're getting our understanding. Here's where I, I have to step back and say, we have certain ideas for how we understand our universe. And this is where I'm going to admit to my own failings. As an astronomer, these are the first tenets that we basically learn once you're done learning the basics of science. When they teach astronomy, they start off by teaching you about the things that went wrong, the geocentric models of the universe, um, how we got to understanding planets over the sun, the scientific method, and then they dive right into breaking you of any sense of being special. In astronomy, we learn everything's the same everywhere. Our universe is a homogeneous mix, and if you grab a lump here and you grab a lump there, it's all made of the same stuff, and it's the same no matter what direction you head off in. The grass isn't greener on the other side, it's in fact identical. And, and this means that where we are is nothing special. We don't have any special vantage point on our universe. And any theory we come up with to describe our universe must describe it as being the same, no matter where someone else might be as they try and understand it. And, and then there's also kind of the zeroth idea. And that's the idea that the reality I perceive, I can scientifically test. That philosophical notion that this mouse exists because in my mind I have chosen to perceive, no, that's not science. Science tells me that this mouse that I'm touching, I can come up with actual understandings about, that when I observe a red light coming off of it, that's, that's actual photons. I'm making an observed understanding of my universe. So this is the foundation on which I base my career. And this foundation has many lines of evidence. And the strongest line of evidence is this thing called the cosmic microwave background radiation. Our universe formed roughly 13.8 plus or minus 0.4 billion years ago. And when it formed, for reasons that can't scientifically, scientifically be understood, all of the matter, all of the energy, everything that is our universe, except for the dark energy, it's baffling. Everything else emerged from a single point that started to expand. And as it expanded and cooled, and it expanded and cooled for about 400,000 years, everything that was the universe was in constant interaction. If a photon tried to get from here to here, it couldn't. It would get absorbed by an electron, by an atomic nuclei. It would get stopped. The universe was opaque. But roughly 400,000 years after that point decided to expand, the universe cooled enough that all of the electrons and all of the atomic nuclei could come together and our universe became neutral. And it also became much emptier. And suddenly, the light, the photons, they could get from A to B. And in fact, they could get from where they were at that point to where we often observe them today. So when we look out, we see all around us this wall of light that was coming from various points all around us where that light is suddenly able to just keep going until it hit our telescopes. And this light, when we look at it, it's all pretty much the same temperature. There's some parts that are a little bit hotter, some that are a little bit cooler, but these variations in general are one part in 10,000. This matches with the everything is the same everywhere hypothesis. This matches with our understanding of how the universe formed. Everything's in beautiful alignment. About 10 years ago, though, they, they found a weak hold spot. Let's see if I can get my mouse to show the weak hold now. So over in the lower right-hand corner over there, there is a squished triangle shape of dark blue. That section's a little bit bigger and a little bit colder than theory predicts. And people have been trying to understand it, and, and there's ways to understand it. If there is, for instance, about one billion light years away from us, a, a section of space that is particularly empty. Well, if it's particularly empty, that means there isn't stuff in it that's gravitationally pulling in the light, 
shifting its color. And as the light is flying through it, and the universe is expanding during that period, the light's getting slowed down as it leaves. Well, that's what happens when there's stuff, but if there's no stuff, there's no acceleration and deceleration. And so that would actually cause a perceived changing in color, a perceived changing in temperature caused by emptiness. So that's how we try and explain that. We're not sure if we're right or not, but it's consistent with our understanding of the universe, so we move on. But then the Europeans launched a new satellite a few years ago called Planck. And it's taking even higher resolution, finer grained images of the cosmic microwave background. And a couple of weeks ago, one of the initial analyses came out. And they found that not only is that cold spot still, still there, but now there's spiky bits. There are places in the cosmic microwave background that are hotter than they should be and colder than they should be. And we can't understand this given our current understanding of the universe. And when this paper first came out, it came out while I was in the process of visiting Greece, which I've learned is a country with no internet. And so, so I was in this small city of, of Bolos for about 10 days attending a teacher training workshop where I was teaching trainers. I was training teachers in astronomy and happily offline, actually quite unhappily offline. Um, but Greece is awesome if you ignore the lack of internet. Um, but then I returned to the internet and everyone's like, tell us about this paper. I'm like, I haven't read it. And they're like, okay, this is what I know. And they, they told me about the spiky bits, and my, my reaction was, that doesn't match with our understanding of the universe. I'm sure that once we read the paper more thoroughly, there's some flaw. There's, there's something someone forgot to do. I was quite happy, having not even read the paper, to say this is probably false. I was making a type 2 error. And, and the reality is I've now read the paper and had this moment of, huh, not so happy with this. Because it forces me to change my understanding of the universe. It forces me to acknowledge that either our understanding of how the universe expanded initially is not quite right, or there's a bunch of stuff that we haven't observed out there that is very small and very dense causing these problems that there's some giant hole in our understanding because this data is right. And we have to, as skeptics, be willing to understand the universe and throw out our understanding when we're confronted with new data. We constantly live on shaky ground and as New Zealanders are used to that. <laughs> but thoughtfully, we're not used to our, our plane of understanding constantly getting shaken and reshaped. And this is what we must learn to do. And we have to understand our ignorance. We have new things to learn every day. And it's very easy for us when we first encounter someone who doesn't know something to go, oh my god, how do you not know that? <laughs> but think about it. We're learning constantly, and, and we're not born understanding everything. We're born understanding nothing. And, and if there's a certain amount of stuff that we're all expected to have heard by the time we're 30, that means that in the US, the number of people between 0 and 30 learning any given idea for the first time is about 10,000. So when you encounter someone who hasn't learned that the Earth rotates around the sun. I actually encountered someone who didn't know that. It, I almost literally fell off a horse when I heard that. It was my horseback riding trainer when I was in college. Didn't know the Earth went around the sun, just hadn't thought about it. And, and I taught her how the Earth goes around the sun while I rode my horse around her. And she was one of the 10,000 people that day who learned that. And so rather than having the, oh my god, how do you not know that reaction? Or the, oh my spaghetti monster, how do you not know that reaction? We need to say, oh cool, you don't know that, let me teach you. We need to change the way that we can 
communicate to people who don't understand. And what we're asking them to do, and what we're asking ourselves to do every time we teach something and every time we learn something, is we're requiring a certain level of trust. And this is where it gets difficult. How do we know who to trust? We have built-in predispositions. There was a rather terrifying experiment done a number of decades ago. It was the Milgram experiment, where they asked people to come in and, and they told them, we're doing an experiment on memory. And we're testing positive and negative reinforcement. Actually, there's no positive reinforcement. There's just negative reinforcement. And every time someone remembers something wrong, we're going to zap them with electricity. And, and as they get things wrong more, we're going to turn up the electricity and zap them a little bit harder. And what they learned is if you have a friendly, gray-haired old male in a lab coat standing next to them, giving them these instructions, which were actually, they weren't zotting real people, they were hitting buttons on a board and there were actors pretending to be zotted. But as far as these people knew, they were giving electric shocks to actual people. What this experiment found is if you put a gray-haired man in a lab coat next to someone, and have that gray-haired man say, it's for science, you need to do this. People will give near lethal doses of electricity, as far as they're concerned, to someone who simply failed to remember something. We trust people who look like authority figures, and we have a predisposed notion. We don't trust the young woman in the sweater and the scarf who looks not like a scientist. This is also a result that comes out of a different study. There was a study done at the University of Texas where there were two separate uh, outreach events that took place. Identical populations of young girls attended both events. Both events had the same instructors. And the woman conducting this experiment took a picture of every single person, all women, who presented to the all girls who were attending this conference. All of the lectures were on science and technology. And when asked, what do you perceive the professionalism of your instructor to be? What do you consider the knowledgeability? What they found, and to, to add actual uh, variability in some cases, they had one set of instructors who during conference A dressed as girly girls, and during conference B dressed as the tomboy with no makeup, t-shirt, ponytail. What they found is the girls considered the ultimate girly girls, the like, duck lip, sun tanned, big haired, it's Texas. Um, <laughs> they, they weren't considered knowledgeable and professional. But neither were the women kind of dressed like college students. It was the people dressed in business casual, who took time for their appearance, but not too much time, that were considered knowledgeable. But given the choice of believing the friendly guy in a lab coat, or a woman, people will generally choose to believe the friendly guy in a lab coat. But let's face it, you always trust the doctor. <laughs> These are both doctors. But who are you going to follow? It's the guy in the suit, the TARDIS. Human perception is something that we have to be careful with. If we judge things based on appearance, it will take us down the rabbit hole, it will take us through the looking glass. We have to figure out how to ask, what do we believe? It's not enough to say, show me your numbers. Numbers can be manipulated. There are three kinds of lies. Lies, true lies, and statistics. This is because it's easy to manipulate things. Do you speak in percentages? Well, if you speak in percentages, and let's say you have an experiment where you're che checking whether or not uh, chickens lay more eggs if you heat their, their coop, and it, it's found that 30% of the chickens do lay more eggs, but the reality is you only checked three chickens. One of them was eaten by a coyote, the other one happened to be a rooster, and the third one really was a chicken. <laughs> well, I just lied to statistics. 
one in three and 30% say very different things. It's not enough to say just show me the numbers. And numbers also can sometimes hide the fact that correlation and causation aren't the same thing. This is where you have to ask, what is your model? What is your equation? What is the underlying theory that guides this claim you're making? Why is it you say that this correlation means that there's a causation? Show me those ties. So when we're confronted with a new idea, we have to ask people to explain not what are the numbers, but what are the causes? What is the model of the equation? And there has to be a predictive value that is testable. This is one of the things that often doesn't get asked about enough. People will say, well, my, my model matches it perfectly. Well, that's fine, hindsight's 2020, and I can make up lots of pretty math. But predict something before it happens. That's how you get the Nobel Prize. And there needs to be a testability to it. It's fine to make a prediction. But if that prediction isn't something that can ever be tested, well, OK, now you've made up shit. It's OK to make up something that isn't testable today. Relativity wasn't testable in Einstein's time. But you have to be able to say, we need to be able to develop the following. And when it's developed, when we build the Large Hadron Collider, we can find the Higgs boson if it exists. And that will prove the theories. And here's where I want you to start thinking about what are testable theories. Einstein is one of these people that has a long-suffering reputation of being the person least believed with the most evidence. As a professional scientist, about once a week, I have someone say, Einstein's wrong. My stomach tells me so. Your stomach can't do calculus. If it could, we could all do calculus. But there's line of evidence after line of evidence from being able to see starlight bent around the sun during the solar eclipse to the fact that your GPS has to make relativistic corrections because the gravity of the planet Earth is accelerating the signals coming down from the spacecraft. The light is getting shifted as it travels. Um, accelerated doesn't actually mean sped up in this case, it means the light. It, it, it gets confusing sometimes with science. And our stomachs reject these ideas. But the math is right and it's predictive and it's true and the models work. And people say, no, relativity can't be right because it doesn't describe what happens inside of a black hole. There's a difference between being wrong and being incomplete. Newton's theory of gravity works just fine for describing what will happen when I drop this pen. It works perfectly for describing how much energy will be released, able to heat the pen, heat the table, and make the noise that you hear. That's gravitational potential energy transforming into kinetic energy, being transformed into sound that your ears hear. That's Newton. Newton doesn't work once you start going close to the speed of light. That's when Einstein is needed. But Einstein doesn't work inside of black holes. And that next billion person just hasn't been born yet. It doesn't mean he's wrong. It means he's incomplete. But people jump to believe, and I don't use that word casually. They jump to believe ideas like the multiverse. The, the idea that our universe is one of a multiple of universes that lie together, bubbling out of a quantum foam. This idea comes from the fact that it's very hard to justify how we live in a universe so finely tuned that we can exist. If gravity was a wee bit stronger, the whole universe would have collapsed shortly after it formed. If it was a wee bit weaker, stars would never have begun. There are so many different characteristics of our universe that we can't find underlying physics to justify. That if they changed even the smallest amount, we'd never get to life. 
And so people say, well, we're just one of many universes, and if you roll the dice enough, you'll get to a universe that contains humankind. And this is their argument for the multiverse. But that's not testable. There's no mathematical model for that. There's no predictions that idea makes that we can go out and try and look for. Saying that we live in a multiverse, it's neat. There's, there's really neat justifications for it that come out of quantum mechanics. But it's not yet science. And then there's string theory. And here I have to say, Brian Greene is perhaps one of the greatest communicators of not quite science I've ever met. Because if you sit down and you talk to someone who isn't funded to do string theory, and who has the mathematical and theoretical physics understanding to be able to understand all of the papers. We'll say it's very beautiful math. It's not true. String theory does not make any predictions that are separate from other theories like supersymmetry and the standard model. It doesn't have a predictive nature. It's not testable. And yet, how many of you have bought books on it? How many of you have bought videos? How many television stations have aired and taken commercial dollars to talk about string theory? It's not up there with the psychics, but it's not science. It's pretty math. And in saying all of this, I'm asking you to trust me because I've asked, is it predictive? Is there underlying theory? And can the predictions be tested either now or in the future? And based on those three criteria, I've made decisions. But I don't have the ability to, me personally, look at the predictive nature or lack thereof of string theory and make a decision. I don't have the ability to, to look and ask, is it testable or not? This is where I look at peer review. And people don't generally understand peer review. And I, I have a great daily show um, link that I don't have time to show, um, but I will tweet it out after this, where there are some people who say, oh, peer review, it, it can't be right because we're just asking the scientists to critique other scientists, and they're all in cahoots together. It's like a jury of rapists judging whether or not someone raped somebody. This is an actual argument that a US Republican advisor has made about how we need to get the general public and Congress deciding what science should be funded because the scientists are just in cahoots with one another. Well, what we don't understand is scientists don't like to believe things. And so when someone comes to me with that plank paper, which I do have the capacity to read and understand. My instant prejudice is they're wrong. And so I read it and I keep coming up with questions and if their paper doesn't answer my questions, it's not right. And when I submit a paper, it gets sent out to a jury of my peers, depending on the journal, anywhere from one to three people, who read the paper and come back at me with questions. And I will often present an idea at multiple conferences and an audience this size or larger will nail me with questions. And it's only after I've been able to satisfactorily answer the questions that my research can get published. This is what peer review is about. It's about building up line after line of data. Now, a paper can get published that says, we only have one line. We need other people to follow up on this. That is still legitimate publishable research. And all because a paper exists with an idea does not mean that it's accepted mainstream truth. In order for something to be accepted, you need multiple lines of evidence, multiple lines of truth. So all because there's one paper, that's not enough. There must be multiple lines, multiple models, multiple things of evidence. Big Bang. We know the Big Bang is true because we have multiple lines of evidence. There's that cosmic microwave background radiation I showed you the pictures of. 
That is predicted by the mathematical models for the Big Bang. Those same mathematical models predict that there will be a specific ratio of hydrogen to helium gaps found in the universe. And we find it. There are predictions on how the universe will go from almost all smooth, continuous layers of gas to forming structure in a Swiss cheese-like way where over time the holes in the structure of the universe get bigger as it becomes more and more lacy as large-scale structure forms. We can build the universe in our computer box and match our models to our reality through multiple forms of observation and evidence. This is truth. This is what it looks like. Dark matter. <coughs> Most annoying thing in astronomy in some respects, because we can't see the stuff. But we can now describe it because we can observe it in multiple ways. If I go outside with telescopes and I look at a band of background galaxies that are a couple million light years away, I can see how they're well, actually I want to look at ones that are about a billion light years away. And I look at how their shapes are distorted. I can look at the variations in those distortions and say this is dark matter between me and them. And I can map out the dark matter by looking at how galaxy shapes are distorted. If I then look at even further away galaxies, look at their distortions. I know that's from the dark matter that's near and the dark matter that's further. And through measuring how light is distorted coming from objects at various distances, I can map the dark matter. I can look at clusters of galaxies using optical light and see where the galaxies are. Using x-ray light, that's the pink in us. I can measure where's the dust and gas. And then I can look at how background galaxies' images are distorted. And that lets me map out the dark matter, the purple. And I find that the dark matter, when in this case two small clusters of galaxies pass through each other, the galaxies, they went right beside each other. No interactions hardly at all. Stars don't generally collide. The gas and dust, big, messy mess in the center, releasing lots of heat and x-rays. The dark matter didn't collide. This actually starts to tell us dark matter is made of particles that are small and like neutrinos don't generally collide. We are building up a model that predicts how we should be able to see dark matter in colliders, how we should be able to see it in heavy water experiments. Dark matter is a thing that is testable with multiple lines of evidence, and we now have prediction. Dark energy? Not quite there yet. We know it's there. We can see it by looking at how our universe is expanding apart by measuring the distance to supernovae and measuring the expansion rate of the universe at different periods of time. What we had expected was when we look at these standard size supernovae of a certain type are all the same brightness. So just like you can judge how far away a motorcycle is by how bright its headlight appears, you can judge how far away a supernova is by how bright it appears. If we know how far away it is, and we use Doppler shifting just like police officers do, to measure how fast it's moving, that tells us the expansion of the universe at different points in time. And we can measure how our universe's rate of expansion is changing. And it's accelerating. And we don't know how to explain this. This artist's rendition is as good as anything else for explaining dark energy. Dark energy isn't a mature theory. It is science, though. It's just science that's half-baked. We have a giant hole in our understanding. It's not quite up to Newton's understanding of gravity. It's more like Kepler's. Planets orbit in ellipses. We know that. Don't know why. Well, the universe is accelerating apart. Don't know why. And it might be because virtual particles are coming into existence and annihilating against each other and there's energy left over. This is the only theory we've got, but when you run the numbers, they're off by a factor of 1 to 120. That's not right. But we have multiple lines of evidence. 
And that's what science is. Science is looking at data. Science is looking at numbers. It's not relying on the numbers. It's not relying on the data. It's relying on the theories used to explain, to model, to make predictions, and to test the predictions. Numbers alone aren't the answer. And when someone comes to you and says, hey, understand this, what you need to ask is, have you gone through the scientific method? This needs to be the small voice speaking from your heart. This needs to be the little voice you trust, the one that goes, okay, you've done this exploration. You've come up with an, uh, an explanation. Can you elaborate on that? And can we engage in testing this? Once we've tested it, can we explore it a little further? And can we keep going and at every step evaluate, at every step run the statistics, check if we've beaten the null hypothesis down? As skeptics, we need to always have the null hypothesis loud and clear and go, is this better than random? And we need to trust people to explain this to us. So our questions are, who do we trust? Well, do they have testable evidence? And at the end of the day, the one thing about everything else that we have to remember is the most miraculous thing of all is we have the ability to understand this universe. Using science, using the scientific method, we have the ability to make testable predictions that explain our reality from the moment of the Big Bang through to today. And that is what we have to remember. It can be understood. Thank you. Okay, we have any questions? I just wondering, in your particular field, um, where would be the leading edge science and thinking in the world? I'm, I'm so sorry, I didn't understand any of those words, but leading edge. Geographically, where is the leading edge thinking and science? in this field, in, in the world, the research institutions, the scientific institutions, where are they? Um, that's something of an unfair question. So, so if, if I understood you're asking where in the world are the leading universities located? On this topic. Okay. Deep science thinking. So, so... Brilliant people can be located anywhere. And so while there are institutions that are better at collecting leading researchers than others, I would never say that because a university isn't one of the top institutions, the people there aren't to be trusted. Every scientist needs to have their credentials reviewed individually. If you look in astronomy in terms of what places have the highest citation rate? The most papers come out of that country that are cited. It's Canada. And, and that's always quite confusing because no one really thinks of Canada as the leading place for research, but it is. But individual wise, there's leading people at many different places. The top places, I mean, it's, it's the normal su su suspects Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard, Stanford. Um, Princeton, it's, it's, there's the usual suspects, but that's because top researchers at a certain point get bought and sold like commodities. But, but the, the Nobel laureate Taylor, who got the Nobel Prize for discovering gravitational waves, prior to getting the Nobel Prize, was just an everyday professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, which is just an everyday regular state university. And so when it comes to where is the next bright young mind who's going to fill in 
Einstein's theories so that we do understand the center of black holes, where are they going to come from? It could be anywhere. So um, I, I can't say any one location is better than another. Australia is currently one of the best funded places. So if you want to go someplace with funding and jobs, go to Australia. Could I ask you an astronomical question rather than a um, skeptic's question? Yes, please. Um, something that's always puzzled me, and I wonder if you'd explain in simple language for me, is in the dark ages, the photons, what actually happens, but they're not charged. They are absorbed into uh, nuclear atoms. Are the nuclear atoms at that stage? Why do they not get out? And is there a similarity between the fact that photons in the center of the sun take between 20 and 200,000 years, depending on who you believe, to get out to the surface of the sun? Is there a similar process? And could you please explain it to me? Simply? Okay, so, so that's two giant questions. <laughs> um, backing up. So, so in this slide, we have a, a timeline of our universe. And it goes from the formation of the cosmic microwave background radiation to a period referred to as the cosmic dark ages, as, as opposed to the time of the plague. Um, they were separated by roughly 13.7 million years. Um, so during the cosmic dark ages, our universe was made of neutral hydrogen gas and helium, roughly 75-25% mix. And the neutral gas, um, it was pretty opaque. It, it's, if a star formed in this gas, its light didn't make it very far. And this is simply because the light that was trying to propagate would get absorbed into the gas and increase the vibrational energy of the molecules and the kinetic energy of the molecules. And it, while it would eventually get re-released, it would get re-released in a random direction. So this is referred to the Dark Ages because if you tried to look at a star, the light from that star couldn't escape the cloud of gas that it was in. We still see pocket examples of this when we look at star forming regions. There are dark nebulae out there that have stars forming deep in their hearts. And we can see this when we look into them with radio light. But the light from those stars can't escape in optical light because all of the neutral gas is absorbing that light. Um, whole universe was like that in the beginning. Over time, as stars formed, the starlight would eat away, ionizing more and more of that gas. You get more stars lighting up, more of the gas gets eaten out until the majority of the universe is not neutral gas, it's instead ionized or the gas is absorbed into stars or gravitationally bound into stars. Um, the, the next part of that that you brought up was when, when a photon is released deep in the center of the sun, it, it takes it millennia to escape. This is because an individual photon that is released during nuclear fusion in the heart of the sun, it undergoes what's called Brownian motion. It heads this direction, it gets absorbed by an atom. It heads this direction, and then it gets randomly released. So if you imagine the life of a poor, drunken sod during a street party, they might be trying to figure out where the nearest bathroom is in a random walk. They go this way, to embrace the bathroom. And they get pointed that direction, and then they get pointed that direction. And eventually, through their random motion, they'll make it outside of the crowd and hopefully before they pee on somebody's shoes. <laughs> this is the life of the photon trying to escape the sun. They eventually are able to escape, but it's through this random motion that takes millennia. Now, the process of a photon trying to escape the sun and a photon trying to get through the neutral part of the universe is similar, but occurs at different temperatures, and, and I mean, physics is all the same at a certain level. A black hole that's the size of a star, and a black hole in the center of a supermassive black hole, exact same physics. But a sun is a hot, dense thing that illuminates the region around it. The neutral gas in the universe, it was just sort of like a fog on a cloudy day. The, the sunlight is glowing through, but you can't really make out any details. So similar physics, but the environment and parameters are different. I hope that helps. Mm -hmm.